of you crying. Welcome, welcome. How you doing? Brother, good evening, brother, good evening. Good evening to everybody that's tapping in. You die. Welcome to another edition of the Moment you of Truth. Got to find How you doing? Deborah, the you billionaire. Wow, what a name. Welcome. Vito, welcome, brother. Welcome everybody that's just chiming in. This is another edition of the Moment of Truth Community Connoisseurs Instagram Live Podcast. I'm aiming for it, Deborah. I love your name, Deborah the Billionaire in the building. Thank you for joining us. We got a special guest in here tonight. Everybody that just chimed in, do me a favor and hit that arrow at the bottom right hand side of your screen and invite 10 of your friends to the chat tonight. This is going to be a great conversation. This man is an entrepreneur, he's a socialite, he's a Harvard graduate, a George, Georgetown University graduate. This man has a lot going on, y'all, and we're super excited to have him on tonight. So please, do us a favor, hit that arrow at the bottom right-hand side of your screen and invite 10 of your friends. I see you on, you're in, Rod. We're going to tap you in in a minute, get this, this, this conversation started. I know you got a lot of Jews to give them tonight, brother. Alright, so really quick, y'all, I'm going to read Rod's, Rodney's bio really quick before we bring him on. So, Rodney Thomas, born and raised in Southeast D.C. Rodney Thomas is a product of both D.C. public schools and the Boys and Girls Club. Rodney attended Harvard University where he was a starting running back on the 2002 Ivy League championship team. After graduating from Harvard in 2003 with a degree in economics, Mr. Thomas moved to New York City to pursue a career in finance on Wall Street as an equity trader at a prestigious Wall Street firm. After seven successful years trading equities, he switched gears and co-founded Dimensional Sports Incorporated, DSI, a full-service sports agency in 2010. In its first full year of inception, DSI represented the number seven overall draft pick of the 2010 NFL Draft, Joe Hayden, and negotiated the largest rookie cornerback contract in NFL history. Over the next four drafts, DSI signed and negotiated contracts for nine draft picks. In 2015, Rodney decided to come back to D.C. and help run Stephron LLC, a full-service construction company his father started in 2006 with just one dump truck. With Rodney's help, Stephron now has six trucks and has established itself as a go-to truck broker as well as one of the premier excavation and demolition, demolition companies in the entire DMV. In 2017, Mr. Thomas founded Good Greenery Consultants, GGC, a cannabis consulting company specializing in, in cultivation and education in Washington, D.C., GGC's mission is to level the playing field and promote social equity in the cannabis space. He is also a stakeholder in Viola, Maryland, who was just awarded a medicinal grow license in Maryland. Mr. Thomas has his master's degree in contract law from Georgetown University and currently resides in Washington, D.C., where he is very active in the community. So without further ado... I'm going to bring Rod in, and we're going to get this, this conversation started. Before I bring him in, y'all, everybody go down to the bottom of the screen, hit that arrow, invite 10 of your friends to this conversation. I'm sure they would love to hear some of these Jews Rod has for us. So one second, I'm going to tap Rod in really quick. Okay, here we go. Right, what's going on, brother? 
What's going? What's good, bro? Man, all is well. All is well, man. First and foremost, on the behalf of Community Connoisseurs, we want to thank you for taking time out of your evening to join us uh, tonight, man. It's How my, you feeling? I'm great, man. It's my pleasure. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. I feel like you're one of the hidden gems in the city, man. So I'm super <laughs> excited for having you. I mean, a lot of people, they see you, you're real humble. You know what I mean? And and, and, and little may know you got a lot. You've had a lot of movements, a lot of things is going on in the city. You know what I mean? So we're just excited to have you, man. And, and again, on the behalf of Community Connoisseurs, you know, we want to welcome you to the, the moment of truth. Like we mentioned before, this is a platform where we give individuals like yourself your flowers while you're here for doing all of the incredible work that you're doing in your respective field. And also, is this is a platform to inspire, to tell about your journey and to inspire our viewers. We got a lot of people tapping in from you, from your from your page, a lot of people from our page, you know what I mean? But I want to get right into it. For those who are tapping in right now who don't know who Rodney Thomas is, a.k.a. Rod TDC, <laughs> let's go all the way back. Let's go take them all the way back, bro, to your upbringing. Tell the people about your upbringing a little bit and, and, and where you where you come from. Okay, yeah, as you mentioned before, man, born and raised in D.C., um, Southeast D.C. I'm proud of that. Uh, my parents were pretty young when they had my, I, I'm actually a twin, a maternal wow. twin. Brother, okay. yeah, Ron, um, we both were born um, a minute apart. There you go. That's a good picture. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. So yeah, you're a twin? I'm a twin, man, yeah. That's what's so, up. I, my parents are fairly young, so I pretty much grew up with my folks, man. My dad was a firefighter. My mom was at the post office, you know, so growing up, of um, meager, meager beginnings, but you know, they, they worked hard and grinded hard, man, and made sure we had enough to get what we had to get. So that allowed us to work hard in school, you know, and in sports as well, which eventually led us to, you know, both attain a scholarship to college to play football. My brother went to William Murray. I went to Harvard. Um, wow. And I have a younger sister as well, Stephanie, who went to, uh, went to Ward, the University of Penn as well. So we all kind of, we did okay. Uh, Shout out to my folks. Uh, like, as you mentioned, after Harvard, I played football four years. I left. Pursued a career in New York on Wall Street at uh, Credit Suisse, um, an investment bank out of Switzerland. Um, out of Sweden, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, I was there for uh, seven and a half years um, from 04 to 2010. Actually, seven years. Um, I left. And, no, and Rod, that's something that I definitely want to tap into, man. And I'm super excited about hearing that story. But I want to take it back one more time, right? So, because this, this is a this a topic right here is very dear to me, considering I'm, I'm also from Washington, D.C., grew up in Southeast, and you are from Southeast Washington, D.C. as well, and you endured all the trials and tribulations of growing up, you know, in in that area, you right. know. And um, that, and these was, it, was, it, was, it was different. It was. And you went to D.C. public schools, and I just want to kind of tap into that experience, because you've accomplished so much, and many times the narrative is, that individuals that come from certain environments can't obtain the level of success that you have obtained. So I want to take it back to your childhood a little bit and just kind of ask you, like, you know, with everything that you've accomplished, what kept you on track? What are some of the things that kept you on track and kept you away from taking the wrong turn growing up in the environments that you grew up in? Without a doubt, man, my, having my pops in the house, my, my mom and dad, I mean, I'm gonna give credit to both parents. Um, Having both parents in the crib, man, making sure that we we couldn't stray away with too far, and also being involved in sports. You know, I played baseball, basketball, football, soccer. You know, so growing up, we was always doing something, stay busy. It was either practice or school. It wasn't much time to be hanging out, you know, messing around the streets or any of that nonsense. I mean, we you know we all bump our heads growing up, mm -hmm. school or hang going to the go gos, and you know, you know, we 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 gotta kind of find our way. But I always, I always, my parents always made sure we had a curfew. You know, wasn't able to you know go certain places, and um, that was big to them. So they made sure, and they put the my dad earlier stayed in fear of us, in fear of God in us. Like we we didn't do what we supposed to do. We was gonna get that that big thick fire department belt. <laughs> fire department belt, huh? That you wore every day to work. <laughs> it ain't hurt, man. Yeah. So I wasn't really trying to feel that pain. So I credit a lot of my success, man. Pretty much all of my success to my parents, man. They 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 held it down. Respect. So a lot of what you can say, because there's a lot of parents that's on here now and a lot of youth is on here now, you know, so a lot of what attributed to who you are today is, 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 is one, you know, you grew up with both of your parents in the household. Yeah, still so the, you, 
do you feel as though that 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 balance of having you know both parents in the household help with credit to some of the decisions that you made because you know uh, there's a a lot of youth that we all work with that are coming ra being raised in single parent households how do you feel that contributes to you know the conscious let's just say the conscious of a youth as they're growing up and developing and they're learning as they're growing up in these different environments just the, that 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 male and female figure in the household how does how do you feel is that, about, that, that helps to, to me it's more about the having the time to to mm -hmm. be like i mean a lot of single parents god bless that's you know god bless them they they make it happen and grandmothers make absolutely it happen and all that but at the end of the day you know when you got one parent always working it's hard for that. If it's only one parent that's always working, it's hard for that parent to be there to take the kid to practice or help with their homework or to just make sure they get paid up from school. And that is my right. parents. We had my, my grandmother was my babysitter. So unlike now, I feel like back in the day, grandma was a little older, so she was at home and she watched all the grandkids. Now it's like, you know, the grandmas are younger, so they actually working. So they yeah, can't. That's home. True. So that whole dynamic has shifted. So I went to school, went to Bunker Hill Elementary, you know, in Northeast. Grandma lived on 12th Street, so I walked to school, walked back home to Grandma's house, and then my, when my parents got off, they picked us up. Then I also had an uncle or a cousin that coached football, so after school, he picked all the kids up, took us to Lamar Riggs, shout out to Riggs Park, where I played football. Wow. So it was, always okay. a, it was always that dynamic where it was somebody involved in the community, whether it be family or a close family friend, that made sure we was on par with everything. So right. I had a whole village, bro. It wasn't just my folks. They, did a, they, they were the the stewards of the ship, but we had a whole village raising us, man, and, I, and I'm grateful for that. And that's wonderful, man, and, and that's and that's key to, like, you know, I'm so happy that you mentioned that because, you know, nowadays it seems like, you know, that's what's lacking in some respect, just having that. I mean, you know, people are, kids are having kids that, you know, there's younger parents and the grandparents are still young as well, and that village aspect sometimes is missing. Um, do, you know, um, shout out to Natu just coming in. I'm glad that Natu tapped in tonight because Natu um, is actually at Harvard University right now. So we're going to talk about your experience at Harvard a bit too. Um, but I definitely wanted to, to tap on that piece in regards to a village. How important do you do you feel that, you know, just not only necessarily having your parents, but also having those coaches, those mentors um, in your life, you know what I mean, to help mold you and help guide you along the way. And if there's any mentors, first and foremost, that you can um, tell the people that you had when you were growing up, who would those individuals be? Yeah, I believe mentorship is is, 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 is a key factor in, in development. I, I, I had, through my walks of life, I've had numerous mentors that kind of guided me to do certain things, whether it be, a, you know, a, a teacher, a coach. When I went to Wall Street, I had my, my, my daughter's godfather who became my mentor, you know, another successful <laughs> black guy that was ahead of me that kind of showed me the ropes. Um, and my dad's been a mentor. You know, I've had a lot of uncles and, and uh, you know, guys that even did things the wrong way and told me not to do it that way. You know, and I, old big brothers or you know, big homies that was, you know, always made sure that around. Like, look, man, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do right because we out here. You know, we can't have that have you mess up. We need you to make a show we good. So that was kind of always motivation. You know, so I, I've been blessed with with a, with a lot of good mentors, and I try myself to be a mentor now for the youth, for younger guys that's kind of trying to walk in the same path or other paths that I can provide insight for. Like, that's that's big as well, you know. And I think that's another thing within the black community that we got to we gotta, gotta keep going. You guys doing that with the connoisseurs and everything, we got to keep that pipeline, bro, and make sure we, we got good role models and good examples for these guys to see that. It's other things you can do besides, you know, sell rock or, or build a block or even play sports or whatever, man. There's a lot of other avenues you can pursue and provide a great life for yourself and your family. And it's our job to be, these, be those examples. You know, and it's, it's, a, it's an array of things you can do. Um, but the most important thing, obviously, is going to school. And that's, that comes first, staying out of trouble. And, I mean, I know it's rough. You know, a lot of kids, they deal with a lot of adversity, man. Uh, they, they hungry. They come home with no, you know, no lights, cold outside. I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of stuff, man. That's a whole system, systematic issue we need to address as well. But, you know, just from a man-to-man -man standpoint and women, we got to make sure that we provide, a, you know, uh, prime examples for them so they can see that we can do certain things. That does not require, you know, being out in the streets or getting in trouble. Absolutely. And speaking of, Steve, speaking of that, you know, um, you're a father, right? Yes, sir. Right, right. So tell us a little bit about, you know, just, you know, that the importance of, you know, male, and shout out to all of the mothers out there, 
You know what I mean? Shout out to all of the strong mothers out there for sure. But fatherhood, tap into that a little bit. I want to, uh, what's your what's your perspective on the importance of a male figure or a father in the house of a father figure or a father or a father figure in the household? What's your perspective on that? Because I see that you have a daughter and, you know, yeah. how old is your daughter? She just turned 12. She's 12 and you're you're very active in her life. You know, you're, you're there every moment. I mean, you cherish her every moment. You're there for her. She looks up to you. Can you explain to the people your perspective on how important that is? Um, just, you know, that fatherhood, father figure inside of the household in the yeah. African-American community. I mentioned you earlier, I, I, I give my success to my pops for being there. I mean, a lot of my friends mm -hmm. didn't have their pops around. They strayed away and took, it, took a different route and ended up not been working out so well for them. I mean, you know, not just being a father in the house, but you got to have a presence in the house as well. You can be a father, but if you're not there, like... Wow, you know, that's powerful. You know, willing to, willing to a strong hand, that, that doesn't matter. You need somebody that's, that's going to be an uncle or a big brother or a dad just having... And I'm saying that because a lot of women are doing are doing both roles, but... Absolutely. And that's able to kind of have them, especially man to man. Having a real conversation with your sons, but the, the dad daughter dynamic is something totally different, bro. Like that's my biggest blessing. And my daughter actually, she changed my life because I was in New York City on my Wall Street. I'm ripping and running, you know. I'm having a ball, man. Then I had a, I had a daughter, and she was in D.C. So it, it, it allowed me to slow down and really cherish like life and really like focus on her and make sure that I got things together. Because you know, when, when it's just you, you living you living day to day, but now you got. <laughs> Provide for you trying to make sure everything is set up so if something does happen to me or whatever that she's good for life you know so that allows you to take certain steps and precautions and put things in perspective man but I feel like you know parenting in, in general man is 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 imperative to 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 all people but I feel like us the black people in general man we gotta in particular it's important because we gotta make sure that we keeping the village tight man and making sure we being there for our kids because there's so many ways. There's so many avenues to go down to get in trouble, man. It's, we we need us to be there to stem the right way. And when they do fall, to be the pillows they can fall on and help them bounce back. Because that's the real thing. We all make mistakes. Yeah. Others have, the others, they have pillows to fall on. A lot of our kids, they don't. When they fall, exactly. that's it. Exactly. They suck in the system where they don't have anybody to vouch for them. But we need to be there for them to allow them to make the mistakes and be able to have them errors, but bounce back and learn from them things and become better citizens. That's kind of what how I view it, you know? Absolutely. Shout out to Ruquan coming in. Ruquan is also That's at Harvard right now. You know what I mean? So I'm just, I'm so glad to see that the Howard fam, is, I mean, I'm sorry, the Harvard fam is- Get it right. Happy. Get it right. I, get know, it. I gotta get it right. You see right. I'm rocking the head. I apologize about that. The Harvard fam is is, um, is is tapping in because I definitely want to touch on that a little bit. Before that though, you went to school, you played football in high school. Um, So in the decision to go to Harvard, you know what? What does what made you want to make that decision to choose Harvard? How did that come about? I didn't apart? want. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to go. You to didn't Harvard. want to go. Nah, man, I was trying okay. to go to Notre Dame or Michigan, so I thought I was. You okay. Know, but the uh, the Harvard coach came to my school like two weeks in a row. It was like, bro, you're a Harvard man. You're a Harvard man. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to Harvard, bro. Like, and I was like, no, you're a Harvard man. So I went on my visit. It was day of winter. It was. Nobody was on campus. It was snowing. It was cold. And I hated it. And I was like, bro, I'm not coming up here, bro. And at the time, you know, it's another thing we got to we gotta really harp on. I think it's a little more now with social media and the internet and everything. People are more aware. But, like, bro, I had a chance to go to Harvard. I'm like, man, I'm, like, I'm not going there. Like, because we, we don't understand the magnitude. And we don't understand what taking them steps and going to that type of institution, how that sets you up for the rest of your life. No matter what you do. Right. Like, nobody can take that from you. And nobody can never... Right degrade you anything because you've done something that only a very limited p amount of people in the world right. are done. And that's getting a Harvard degree. Right. So at the right. time, like, man, I'm not trying to go to Harvard, bro. Like, whatever. But my mom's like, look, just do it for me. You know, and at the time I'm, I'm 18, I'm like, you know, mom's, she seemed to say about this. It is Harvard. You know, me not knowing mm -hmm. exactly how amazing Harvard was, but I knew what I knew what it was. You know, most people think of Harvard, they think of how high in the movie with Matt Redman and Ruffin Man riding around smoking and everybody corny, everybody square. And I yeah. got totally different. Mad liberal, mm -hmm. mad people all over the world coming together. Uh, it was a great experience, bro. Right, the, This is the best decision I made in my life, without a doubt. Oh. It was in, in hindsight, it wasn't a hard decision, but I made it hard. And that's what we do. We always got to right. make it My bad. Yeah. Make, make it difficult. You know, but like 
it basically shout out to Coach Hughes, Hank Hughes who recruited me without and Coach Murphy that signed me. Without those guys, I wouldn't have went there. But so I'm I'm I'm, I'm thankful for them guys to come and sort me out in DC and um came my mom's crib, ate Domino's pizza, talked about, you know, about the school and everything, bro. It was it was it was a blessing and I'm glad that I was able to to follow that path and, and fulfill that dream. Right, right. And and, and shout out to all of the H E B H B C U's. But I know when you made your decision, you you had a, a little backlash. How did you deal with that? Because you know, for some apparent reason, I wanna feel I wanna hear what you feel about this. Because some people, you know, they can look at that like, oh, you're going to a PWI. You know, in my personal perspective, I look at it like, why not go to one? You know what I'm saying? Like, why does it have to be? Let me get that. Because I, like I said, I went to D.C. public school from kindergarten through ninth grade. Then I went to private school, went to Gonzaga. They recruited me to right. play for the Bullets. So I was already right. on the same mindset in terms of yeah. wanting to go to school. And I will say this, and no shout, no, no, no credit to D.C. public schools, but that mm -hmm. private school experience allowed me to bridge that gap because then I was able to kind okay. of, you know, identify with certain people that I wouldn't identify with if I didn't make them decisions, you know. So I would have oh, come get me. But I was able to, to go to school in Potomac, Maryland, and, like, go to the big houses, see the, you know, stay the sale refrigerators and, like, meet Jewish people and Mormon people and different different walks right. of life. I got to Harvard. It was like, yo, this is, I mean, I'm, I, 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 fed, I fit in. I was still a D.C. kid. I had dreads. I was, you know, I was me. Yeah. Kind of too hard to stay being me as a as a as a as opposed to embracing the culture, which I eventually did. But you know, that's all a part of learning. But I was able to actually, you know, take that step, which to me was 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 a great thing. That's wonderful. High schools, I didn't like I said, I played ball and I was pretty good when I came out. So I had like the high Division One school recruiting me. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't really focused on going to smaller schools. I mean, I, Howard Art is a great school as well, but I always knew I would want to go to. A, <laughs> A big football school, or like you know, a, a, like an Ivy League school. Absolutely. So we, of course, we have some Harvard students on watching right now, and both of them are freshmen. Um, what advice would you give them, um, considering they're just they're new on campus? I mean, you know, we're in the middle of pandemic; things are a, a lot different um, than when you were there. But what kind of advice would you give the two Harvard? students that's on right now the two harvard freshmen natural and ruquan that are on right now on how to you know be true to themselves but also embrace the diversity of the of, of the campus and the, and the environment in general yeah so i told ruquan this i said my biggest my biggest regret was trying to graduate too fast like trying to get to the money like trying to take the the, the class that give me the the easiest the most credits to get out the, the earliest instead of like embracing the curriculum embracing the, the like the the student body and really like experiencing Boston and really like like you know taking all kind of different electives and things like that and really like take advantage of the opportunity because you don't even get the opportunity right. one time once you leave right. you're gone. so like I was I was I was an econ major so I was trying to take my calculus class my my, my uh -huh. get out of there versus like taking different courses all like you know like you know Confucianism or I mean whatever they offer literature all kind of stuff that you can take right. To expand your horizon and really put yourself on a different level from a thinking standpoint, and not just worried about the what's in front of you. You know, and that's another thing. Like as black people, man, I hate going back to this and just coming up. You know, for meager beginnings. When you're in college, you're trying to go to college to get to the paper. You ain't really there to enjoy the experience. You there to, to get you to right, right. make some money. You know, so once you're in college and you if you're able to like you know get some work study money and like really able to enjoy the the opportunity and can and you can relax. And my roommates, bro, they party every night. Like white boy, mm -hmm. boss. I was like, bro, like, like, bro, what's your biggest worry? He was like, my, my biggest worry in life was to make sure everybody around me is having as good a time as I'm having. And when wow. he told me that, that changed my life. I was like, bro, like, I'm thinking about just trying to get shit done. And he's like, he having fun. He's actually enjoying the process. Enjoy right, right. But once you graduate, bro, it's all working bills. I mean, right. it's, but it's nothing like college, you know. So right. my biggest advice to those two young men: first of all, congrats, man. That's, 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 a, that's a blessing. To come from the city, to going to a school like Harvard, but man, take your time, enjoy, the, enjoy your time there, mingle, take different classes, see the city, man, and just and just and just and just and just have fun, man, because like life is gonna be there, you know. So enjoy that time in the bubble, as we call it a bubble, and then the Harvard Yard, man, and, and just and then and embrace the experience because you only get that type of opportunity once in life, man. It's a great one, so definitely enjoy that, man. Back. That's what's up. That's solid. So, um, you. 
you study economics, you got the, your degree in economics. Can you touch a little bit on how important that degree was for you to obtain and how it how it helps with you with everything that you have going on right now? Well, I pursue econ because Harvard, like I said, is a liberal arts school, so we don't have like finance and accounting as major, mm -hmm. unlike U Penn mm -hmm. with the Wharton School of Business. So a lot, a lot of the cats that was going to Wall Street, they were econ majors. But you, I mean, you come to find out if you go to Harvard, bro, you can major in art history, you can major in sociology, you can major in psychology. They understand right. the employee, the, the the people that's trying to hire you, the employers understand if you have a Harvard degree, you can learn. You're able to learn, you're able to process, you're able to deal with people. So in hindsight, I might have took art history or something just to kind of like expand, but the econ was, was great in teaching me, you know, coming from, from I had a good, pretty good math uh, background in high school, but it wasn't great. I wasn't like an AP calculus. Now. So when I got to Harvard and going to econ, I was able to take like supply and demand and general, just learn different fundamental uh, things that you need to, to, to go to business or to run a business with, you know, like just so basic, basic stuff that I didn't know. They, that it taught me, you know, to, to an, another level. So I was able to really, I really appreciate that part because I was able to really kind of, when I got on Wall Street, I knew kind of what to do as opposed to trying to learn everything, you know, from scratch, which is a great opportunity. That's dope. That's dope. So that's a wonderful segue into my next topic, Wall Street. Tell the people a little bit about that experience, your experience. You were in Wall Street for seven years. Seven, you know? yeah, uh, Black man on Wall Street from Southeast Washington, D.C. Hey, what I, better can, what, how better can it get? Tell us about that experience. Ah, <laughs> uh, man, it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was amazing, bro. I mean, it's nothing like it in terms of just because, A, A I don't, I'm not sure. First of all, let's just take a step back. And there's another thing going back to the education and information that we need to have access to as we kind of, as we come along. I didn't even know what the hell Wall Street was, bro, coming out of high school. Like, I thought there was a street in New York that was just, you know, yeah. where the soccer chains were. Yeah. We're not taught that that's a career path that if you pursue and if you do well in, you can make millions and millions of dollars without, you know, yeah. not dribbling the ball, yeah. taking a hit or anything. Not being a doctor or a lawyer. Going to New York or going wherever you go and just being a trader or a salesman, you can make a lot of money. And I didn't even know that until yeah. I went to college. And, and so my senior year, I was kind of like, what am I going to do when I graduate? And a lot of the guys I play ball with were graduating and working at Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers and Morgan Stanley. And then I was like, yo, I'm going to try this thing out. So I took a trip to New York. My brother's girlfriend at the time, his sis her sister worked at Goldman Sachs. She was Nia Gandhi. Uh, she a legend, man. And um, they from D.C. And she was like, I got a, I got a <clears throat> homeboy that I think that you'll be a great um, mentee to. You should come meet him. He's a Wall Street guy. His name's Troy Dixon. And you guys need to Google Troy Dixon when I give up this conversation. He's that guy, man. He got black on heads fun from New York with the Holy Cross. He's a beast. So I go to New York, bro. This is in 19, it's in 2003, on a little weekend trip. My man picked me up. He got a suit on. He got the driver outside. You know what I'm saying? They take me out. They out with Derek G. Oh, Troy, I think Rob might have froze up. We're gonna get him back on real quick. Cause he look, he seemed like he going, he he getting ready to drop some real jews on his good. Rob, you there? Yeah, I'm good. I'm back. We good? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wait, what's the last thing you heard me say? You were uh you were talking about Derek G. Oh, Derek Jeter, you know the, the Derek Jeter. Okay, yeah. I'm out with Derek, Derek Jeter, A Rod. Okay. All these cats behind this club called Sweet Sixteen. They drink Cristal, more wet. Like, I'm like, man, what, what's going on, bro? Right. And these black cats, they got on suits, but they cool, though. They like me, but they just, right. you know, they walk the walk, talk the talk. And I'm like, man, I got to do what y'all doing. You know, so the <laughs> next day, I kind of went to the office, his office, and we sat down. He showed me kind of what he does. He was a bond trader, mortgage back security, MBS trader. He traded mortgage back security, wow. which at the time was big business. You know, before the crash, that was from 01 to 08. That was, that was big, big money. Mm -hmm as the interest rates were low and everything, and people were buying houses. So he was he was a mortgage back trader, man. He um sat me in the desk and was like, bro, I, I promise you this, if you if you dedicate yourself to this to this craft, you can make a lot of money and do well for yourself. After that trip I was sold, I was like, bro, I'm going to Wall Street. So when I got back school, my whole mission from that point was to get a job in Wall Street. So I was kind of already late in the process. So I had I took a job at Fannie Mae in DC which is a great company as well. But I was already trying to interview to get to New York. So I came out of school in June. 
I worked at Fannie Mae for like three months. I got a job in New York and I moved up there in, um, in February 2004. And for them, man, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was, trials, it was trials and tribulations. I mean, I was, I had to adjust because I wasn't used to corporate America, the corporate right. environment, uh, smiling your face, stab you in the back. Yeah. You know, all that shit, bro. I wasn't I wasn't prevalent to that because I never had a formal internship in corporate. Right. I always came home and worked out in the summer or was like a mentor or, or summer camp. So it took me, you know, a while to kind of understand the game. And like I had luckily I had mentors to kind of let me know how things were. But like I said before, the best learning is when you do make your own mistakes. You know, so in New York, man, I'm making money, I'm partying, I'm having a good time. A couple times I overslept, it's kind of work late, you know what I'm saying? I'm getting reprimanded. Yeah. Like that, you know, just 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 the growing pains of being young and successful, but at the same time, still trying to figure things out, you know. So um, it took me a while, but I, I I um I was I was only one of it was three of us on the desk of a black out of like forty people. It was myself, another black dude, and a black girl, um on the desk. So like as you you know, I had to adjust to that. On my first day at work, I wore a sweater with no collar, supposed to have a collar shirt on, but it's no <laughs> written dress code. But right, right. Stuff, right, you know, like yeah, got is, and I'm, I'm yeah, you I'm, had to polish it up a little bit. You know I, had, I, mean? I, had to get, I had to go to Brooks Brothers and get a couple button ups, right? right. <laughs> and get my yeah. game right, man. But you know, first year was an adjustment period, but once I got the hang of it and I started to show what I can do, they gave me more, you know, more leeway, and I started to do well, man. I had a pretty good, I said, I had a pretty good career, you know. I, I cut it short, I wish I would have stayed maybe one or two years longer, but I started my business in, in 2010, and we had a fresh on draft pick. And I always wanted to be in sports, so I kind of just left and did that full body. So that was, but no regrets. Though it was a great experience. And and I mean, that's seven years strong, man. That's 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 honorable, man. And that that story in itself is just, you know, very very, you know, a great story and it's an inspiring story. I want to take a moment, really quick, to look into the comments. I see a lot of people tapping in. A lot of people. Uh, we got Tony Perry Jr. that came on. Nate Hawkins. Okay, I see Kaya and hey Kaya, you know I see a couple great people. Yeah. You know what I mean? That we, we know mutually. You know what I mean? A lot of a lot of uh, comments. Somebody just said, "No more interruptions. This story is getting too good to interrupt." So uh, yeah, man, thank you all for tapping in. And look, if you all have any questions for Rod while we're here, we have them for about thirty more minutes. Please drop them in the comment box. I'm going to pin the questions. I'm trying to I'm going to try to answer as many questions as possible. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comment box. Thanks again for joining. This is the moment of truth. Rod, so you talked about the importance of, of mentorship, right? I definitely, you know, as a, our nonprofit organization, Community Connoisseurs, one of our pillars is mentorship, with youth development, mentorship, and minority entrepreneurship training. So tell us about, you know, you know, some of your mentors. Um, some of the people that inspired your journey. I know you talked about your dad, you know what I mean, your mom, you know, your yeah. parents. But who are some of those individuals along the way that kind of molded and guided you and kept you on track to do some of the things that you're doing today? Like I, like I mentioned, man, my, my my daughter's godfather, Troy Dixon. Uh, I met him in, I met Troy in 2002. Um He's a Libra as well. Birthday October, he just had a birthday October fourth, so happy belated birthday. But he was like my big bro, man. He kind of like walked me through the, took me, taught me everything in terms of just how to walk, how to talk, how to dress, uh, how to move in certain circles, how to deal with certain people. You know, and that whole in that whole Wall Street climate, that was like my, my. He made me. I got made super intros. He's my biggest investor when I started my company. You know, so um, and like I said before, I met my daughter's godfather. So he was kind of the guy that kind of you know helped me navigate the water. Got to New York, and and from that I was able to kind of parlay into other ventures, which allowed me to to, to have um, success in a lot of different ways. You know, um, other mentors. Man, I had a, some good coaches back then at Lamar Reyes, Coach Toby, Coach Al, Coach Rob, Coach Yates. All good guys, man. I always made sure that we got the practice on time. Made sure that we was we was we was we was how we needed for the games. Um, and even we didn't we didn't have they made sure we had it. You know, they they looked out for us, Coach Sellers. Um, yeah, man. I mean, a lot of coaches, man. I mean, I guess I sports baseball or basketball my whole life. So, I man, you can tell you a you're a true Washingtonian, man. You said Lamont Riggs, man. I remember that's the what was that? The Jabo Kennedy. Jabo Kennedy. Jabo Kennedy. The, the gold, the golden black oh, Lamont Riggs, gold. man. Oh, I used to play for P.I. Harris, man. Y'all used to punish us. Yeah. We had a good little thing going. Good thing. 
Yeah, okay. definitely. So let me, uh, I got a, a question that came in from Vito Premier. Um, you spoke a lot about some of the, the mentors that you had. Thanks for sharing that. But Vito wanted to ask you, and the special advice, what special advice do you have for someone that's a mentee? How can you be a great mentee? A great mentee? Listen, first of all, but I think that the, the first step is to try to find or identify mentors that uh, have have the same type of vision as that you that you have, but they're able to kind of show you or teach you how to achieve what you want to achieve. You know what I mean? It's, I mean, I've had different mentors that do different things, but at the same time, you kind of attract the people that have this like-mindedness. So I think as a mentee, first of all, try to surround yourself with people that can help you. Like, I always try to make sure I'm the dumbest person in the room, bro, because if everybody was smarter than me, I can't do nothing but learn. If I'm the smartest guy in the room, usually that that's not fun. You know, so I try my yeah. best around myself with like-minded people that can help me, you know what I'm saying? If I need a question or I need, like I said before, you want to you eventually want to start a company, you might need an investor, you might need information, you might need a relationship. Like, try to find people that are connected that can help you be connected. And that's kind of how, that's how life works. That's, 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 that's kind of the secret sauce. It's relationships. That we don't, we don't, we, we scared to kind of come out our bubble. We kind of stay within our little network and we want to just be within us. But the key to life is, is meeting other people that allow you to meet other people to do other things and, 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 and find resources that can help you better so or level up to whatever you want to do. And to me, so I tell anybody that's a mentee to make sure your mentor is is doing something that you want to do or better so he can allow you to find, kind of pursue that path as well. Not don't have a mentor that's a dumb dumb or a knucklehead or, I mean, you can learn from them, the mistakes they make, but that mm -hmm. should be your mentor. Your mentor is somebody that's going to help you learn <laughs> to be a better person. One day you can be a mentor as well. Absolutely. And speaking of speaking of good relationships, I got to uh, uh, take a moment just to shout <laughs> out my man, Tony Lewis. Oh. I know you and Tony have a phenomenal uh, relationship. And um, Tony actually came on a moment of truth. We had the pleasure to have him on this platform, and he dropped some jewels. And after he came on, he him being the person that he is, he said, "Man, you should you should definitely reach out to Rod and have Rod on the show." So I just wanted to salute Tony Lewis for the plug, man, because when he said, "I'm like, wow, yeah, that is a great catch." So we made yeah. it happen. Appreciate you, brother. Shout out to Tony Lewis. That's my um, brother. That's family. So we 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 locked in forever. No doubt, no doubt. So you mentioned DSI, you know, uh, Dimensional Sports, um, the 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 um, organization that you co-founded. Um, that's a sports agency, right? Yes, sir. For so sir. I like what you did, man. You took your 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 um, talent, which was sports. You know, you went to school, you obtained an education, and once you were finished with, you know, actively playing sports. You took it to another level and created a sports agency where you can support other athletes that were coming up with similar journeys than yourself. Tell people about that. Tell the people about that a little bit, and and, it, and give a little bit of advice because I I think I seen AJ come on. Shout out to AJ. I think he does something similar to that as well for those individuals who are in that game that's doing that type of work or those who inspire to do that type of work. Give them some advice on how the best methods of getting that that started. Um, what those would be? Well, the vision at the time, the vision was the you know to you know start a black owned firm that because you know majority of athletes are black, right? But they but most of the agents are white, so why not try to start a business where they can relate to people like they look like you and they can help you you know pursue your dreams and kind of like form a, a family close knit you know network that can with trust and you know shout out to Victor Cruz. Um, and we can. We thought, you know, we, it was myself and my two partners, Josh and Malik, both successful, uh, both in the UVA. Josh played basketball. And Malik was a lawyer. Um, so we all linked up, man. And the goal was to form a company that was like nobody else. But at the time, there wasn't many black owned. In fact, I don't think there was any black owned firms that were really doing it big at the time. There were some good black like Alvin Kills and guys like that, and Eugene Robinson, but they worked for white companies. We started mm -hmm. our own firm to us. No. Nobody else. It was us. We raised our own money. We had our own rules. We did it our own way. We were the first, I want to say the first all-black firm to be in the green room, which is where they invite you when you're a first-round draft pick three years in a row. You know, and our first draft, our first client was a top 10 pick, Joe Hayden, um, out of Friendly High School, uh, PG County, mm -hmm. Cleveland Browns number seven. The next year, we signed two more DMV kids, 
uh, Rock Carl Michael and Ryan Williams. Uh, then in the after that, we signed E.J. Manuel, who was uh, the first quarterback taken in that draft. We were the first all-black front to have a black quarterback taken in the first round. You know, wow. and then in the midst of all that, we wound up signing Victor Cruz, who won the Super Bowl with the New York Giants. So we had a lot. We had it rolling, man. It was um, it was a whirlwind experience. Just kind of like being young. We I was twenty nine when we started the company, bro. We was so we was young, but we was we was definitely getting to it. I mean, that's probably was a detriment because a lot of our parents was older than us. You know, so it's like we got to kind of come in and, and live them and prove them that we can do it on the business standpoint and also relate to that relate to the kids as well. So right. it was an old approach. You know, like I said before, we signed. 10 draft picks in five years and had a pretty pretty good run. I mean, it was – in every business, it's, it's pitfall, so and a lot of lessons learned. If I can do things differently, I probably did a little differently in terms of having more people on the team to have to give the athletes more access. And uh, also, we thought that being young and cool and hanging out with the guys was the way to go, and that attracted guys mm -hmm. to you. But then a lot of cats, when they see that you kind of partying with them, they don't take you as serious. You know, exactly. So, Exactly. So, and it's good to kind of, if you're going to be that front, man, have somebody in the back that's kind of just like just doing the contract and, and only kind of always being a serious person. You know, so all those are like lessons learned. But we had, I mean, from 2010 to 2015, bro, we had an epic run, you know. And I put out five years against anybody, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, all good things come to an end. I took those lessons, took those funds, and I piloted into something else, you know, right now. It's bigger and better, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm moving a different way. But I, I think that that industry, and also now, it's a lot more black agents with Instagram and everything, and social media. Uh, you're a lot more visible, so you can do a lot more marketing. So I think that we had started in 2018, mm -hmm. and it'd be a rock for everybody else, you know. But at the time, it was kind of still transitioning. Social media, Instagram hadn't even started yet. Twitter had just kind of started, you know. So we wasn't really um, privy to having them tools. And really being able to kind of like allow people to see what we're doing across the, across the country, you know. So now, I, you know, but I got no regrets, man. We had a great run. Like I said before, I met some great people and great relationships. Some of my ex clients, some of my best friends right now, and those guys are also doing great things. And like I told you before, it's all about relationships and connections and not burning bridges. So you might need them people another day to, to do something else. And mm -hmm. Absolutely, man. That's amazing how you. How your life you just started and you 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 kind of made something out of every state step of your life you know what i mean like from sports to college uh graduating with a degree in economics to utilizing some of the things that you learn in economics to go into wall street you know what i mean from leaving sports and and, and starting your own sport sports agency man you've just been connecting the dots all your life so i want to commend you on that brother I see AJ dropped a comment and it said Rodney and his company were the first African American agents to really boom in the NFL. Okay, so you got a lot of love. That's my uh, name. A good lot good. of love, man, coming in the, in the text. I had some questions as well, but before I get to those questions, because I definitely want to cover, um, you know, just all of the entrepreneurial endeavors that you have going on and how you took one pat, one bucket, and, and, and dumped it into others. So from the sporting agency and the things that you were doing at Wall Street, um, your father actually started a company, um, a construction company called Stefron LLC. And yeah. you took it and took it to another level. Tell, tell, tell the people about that experience, how that manifested, and, and, and some of the things that um, you did along the journey to make that company a success that it is today. So first of all, Stefron, my sister's name is Stephanie, and my okay. dad named both Ronnie. So Steph Ron was kind of the the name. I, I thought it was stupid, but my dad he, <laughs> he put that. Yeah. Uh, right. My pops, man, he the he the he he the real goat, bro. Like I do well, but without pops, it wouldn't be no me. Like he born and raised in D.C. uptown, went to McKinley Tech, no college degree, D.C. firefighter, twenty five years, um, and um, he, he, back in old six, he like I'm gonna buy a dump truck. When the Spanish dude was like, Dad, you buy a dump truck for you can't even drive a dump truck. So he got a CDL, bought the dump truck, drove to New York to get the truck, and drove the truck all the way back. And at the time, my other cousin, uh, D.D. Hinton, uh, had already had a, a, a company going on with contracts, so my dad kind of started working under her. Uh, but my dad being my dad, realizing the loopholes in D.C., at the time, wasn't a lot of uh, black-owned dump truck companies with their minority certification, CBE. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So he he got a CBE, and once he did that, a lot of the jobs that the government give out to these white companies, they need minority participation. So mm -hmm. my dad was getting all the phone calls to the work because he had a CBE. So that's mm -hmm. kind of how we started, you know, building this brand. He started brokering other trucks. And um, he kept saying, yo, Rock, come back home, man. There's a lot of money in this dirt. I'm like, dad, I'm not trying to be in no dirt. I'm, I'm good with that, bro. Like, I'm, I'm in New York. I'm having a good time. I'm doing my Wall Street right. uh, agency thing. You can have that, that dump truck thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so back, like in 2015, I came back home with the Georgetown to get my master's. And uh, I was home, and I kind of was just like, as I was home, I started just coming around the office and kind of just like shout on my dad and just seeing what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I realized that a lot of people I went to high school with, they they over there dad said big companies already in construction, like Grantley and Davis and Folger and Pratt. I went right. to these cats. So I'm like, man, you know what? I'm like a parlay this or something. So I was, I started, you know, I kind of like in 15, I kind of like, I kind of slowly started transitioning. And then by 2017, I was all the way in. And, uh, you know, making networking, kind of help build the brand. Um, and then uh, we got a couple of big contracts and was able to kind of build our company up. But then this last year, we got the big contract on the table. Yeah, I was actually able to experience that, man. But put us on the um, app. And then from that, from there on, bro, it's been, it's been awesome. Like, you know, so government and private deals. I've been kind of like in, in the business development side, like helping to source contracts and uh, increase our profile. And it's been, um, my dad's trying to retire. He's saying he retired next year, so supposedly. He been standing for three years now, so I was like, you know what, man? Let me give this shit a, a real look, man. Really dedicated. It's a family business, black-owned business from the mud. Like, why not? You know. So I just started I just, with one dump truck. One started with one truck. One. Now we got six trucks. Right. Now. Broken like thirty or forty, and we got all our own equipment. You know. So my my brother was already in with my dad, so they working together already. I just joined the team, so now it's. You know, we we doing our thing, man. I've been blessed, man, for, for sure. And I gotta say, man, that parking lot that you all did at Martha's Table is beautiful. I appreciate um, it. You know, I I seen a lot of the development over there, and and you you all did a phenomenal job on that parking lot. And um, you have do your your construction company. What's the website? I want to pin the website just in case someone wants to do more research. Someone needs some work done. You someone has a contract uh, proposal or anything like. I got major, I got major dot, major about to uh, put the site together for me, but the Instagram okay. at Stephron LLC, and all the info is on the, is on the, is on the Instagram page. Say that, say that Instagram again. Stephron S T E F R O L L C is the IG, and all the info okay. is on the Facebook page as well. But the website's coming though. Now that we done, we done really like start to flex and start to put the, put the website together. You know, um, but yeah, man, look us up. Any excavation, demolition, um, dirt hauling, or like any kind of aggregate materials need hauled away, we make sure it get done for you, for sure. Absolutely, man. That's 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 huge, man. That's huge. So, moving forward, we're gonna tap in a little bit on this this other endeavor. You got a lot going on, man. You know what I mean? I think we need oh, bro, more hey. power when we talking to you, but yeah, muscle, muscle revenue streams, bro. That's 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 how you gotta stay stay relevant. You know, let's so. let's talk about let's talk about really quick before we go into that next that next entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, that your experience at Georgetown because not only did you go to Harvard, you came back home right and got your degree in contract law at Georgetown. Yeah. Well, tell, I, tell, tell, at the time the NFL changed the rules so in order to get it to be a certified agent, you had to even have a master's or relevant experience or a law degree. So I was like, mm -hmm. I'm not law school, and I didn't play. Mm -hmm. I didn't play enough football to consider myself a pro. So I decided Georgetown had a program called the Sim Program, which is a sports program. They have that in Georgetown, Columbia, and NYU. Um, it's like a, a 50 credit program. It's like what, 20 credits. You can do it in a year and a half, all evening classes. Um, it's not cheap, but it was it was it was it was definitely a great experience. The staff is like is well renowned. Um, I met some great people. And I, yeah, I went there. I came in there in 2013. Came out of 14 for my masters. It was it was it was a good time, man. I mean, sports anymore. So it's like well, I'm kind of still in my toes still dip, but I'm not an agent per se anymore. So is the degree right. relevant? I don't know, but I mean, I still got a Georgetown degree. So it was it was it was it was a good it was a good time. Yeah, it's a prestige thing at this point. You know what I'm saying? Like you have a Georgetown degree. That's heavy, man. Yeah, so man. man, salute to that, man. That's very inspirational how you see different avenues uh, or career paths that you're looking towards and you do everything it takes to make sure that you have the back end 
that you need to approach whatever it is that you want to approach in the most appropriate way. I love that about you, man. So salute to you for that. Thanks, um, so let's move into 2017. Okay. That, you know, three years ago, you, 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 you founded the good greenery consultants company. Yep. Um, now I know initially when we talked, I said we was going to keep it light with this conversation, but Hey, it's, it's a legal business. Yeah. Um, it's a thriving business and it's something that you're doing. So I definitely want to cover that. I think we have a couple of, people on here that tapped in just to kind of hear your experience with it and how that um that manifested and you know get some more information on what you got going on with that yeah so you know obviously i believe in 2015 or 16 dc um they made you know an initial 71 initial 71 became you know the new policy where it kind of made the gray area where we you can possess up to two ounces you can cultivate at home um if you get you know get locked, if you get caught uh swollen on a citation. So that kinda that kinda lowered the barrier in terms of from a legality standpoint. It'd be easy to kinda navigate the waters outside of being, you know, the somebody on the corner trying to sell down bags. You know, it was it's a whole it was a whole number that was that was kind of being created. And the, the funny part is, and as I as I, I mentioned before, it comes back to information, bro. So the list for like getting a dispensary or a legal cultivation center in DC had been out since like 2001. But if you didn't, you wasn't in the know, you never would know to apply for those type of licenses because we wasn't, first of all, you had to have the money and the capital. And also if you don't have the information through the Department of Health, you would never would have known to apply. So I think now it's uh, seven dispensaries and four cultivators of which is only one black cultivator. And it's, I believe it's two black dispensaries, you know, and they're trying mm -hmm. to, work on that approach, maybe go on to recreational weed, but to go back to GGC, so the law was that you can grow at home. So I was like, you know, mm -hmm. why not take advantage of that? So I formed a team of, of growers that will come to your crib and grow for you, you know, and just mm -hmm. be, and then we'll grow whatever you, whatever legal, legal limit, six plants or 12 plants, and we'll grow that for you and they just pay us a, a retainer. And then we started our own little thing. We'll just, we'll just pay us. We have our own garden and we'll grow for you in our garden. And then once we, we harvest, you know, we, we, we'll give you most of the harvest and we'll keep some as a fee. And uh, also we wanted to get into education because like you said, like I said before, in DC alone, Canada is going to be a $1.6 billion industry, mm -hmm. not million, mm -hmm. billion, bro. And billion. there's so many ancillary ways you can make money in a business, security, testing, transportation, finance, accounting, legal. So not just growing and, and selling, but also mm -hmm. all the services that are needed to make a business, you know, come around full circle. And, I'm trying, I'm trying to let people know, bro, it's so much, like, if you go to Cali or to Colorado, people making so much money, it's crazy. And if you're not going to be a, a part of this industry, I know and people have their own beliefs, you know, some people, you know, the old school people, and I don't want to touch it or whatever. But, right. bro, it's right, like, right. like prohibition. Yeah. In the 30s, alcohol was illegal. But they still mm -hmm. had, you know, making moonshine and all that. They was doing all that little thing. Jack Daniels, Jim Bean, they was mm -hmm. all making wine and whiskey back in the day illegally. Then they made it illegal. Now they all rich, you know. So I believe we missed the tech boom. A lot of us missed the housing boom. This green wave is coming. It's like the real, the next, and the, maybe the last wave for African Americans to make a lot of money, bro. So if you're not yeah. to, to make some of that money and to benefit any kind of way, whether, whether it be just getting that lounge where you can come and smoke or, like I said, security, transportation, whatever you want to do, bro, with so many ways to get involved to get a piece of the pie. Like, I think you're crazy, and I and I, I had to capitalize on that. Then I got lucky enough through my like I said before, life is is a, is, a, is all about connections and who you get to meet. I'm in the Malibu and Nobu with Victor Cruz, Fourth of July All White Party. I meet Al Harrison. What's Al Harrison doing? He started his own cannabis company, Viola. Wow. Black, one of the industry leaders right now in the company, and we mm -hmm. kind of just you know we exchanged numbers, kind of was talking back and forth. So when Merlin came on board to you know to give their licenses. I call out like, yo, bro, we should apply in Maryland. We put a team together, we apply for the license, and we won. You know, so okay. now I'm not only doing good greening, but I also have a stake in Viola Maryland, which we're going to come to come to market 2021. And we're going to try to be the premier cannabis brand on the East Coast. So, you know, and that's what you call group economics, man. I love it. Uh, I love it. That's what you call group economics. Reentry employment, education, expungement, like, 
we're gonna you're gonna see it's gonna be a big push for the brand locally, bro. We're gonna really be on top of making sure giving people all the opportunities and the information we can to allow us, us to capitalize on this shit, bro. Cause it's gonna be it's gonna be crazy. And then DC after this election it probably will go recreational and will allow other people to kind of have like like some micro licenses that like maybe do edibles or like small grows or like you know the whole like craft beer model. You kind of do your own thing where you can sell to bigger distributors and make money that way as well. So like anybody that's kind of on the fence with their careers or want to do a side career or a side hustle, man, look into this cannabis thing, man. It's medicinal. It's a plant. It helps people. And we've been going to jail for this shit way too long not to make money off of it, bro. And I'm on it. I'm on top of it, bro. So anybody hit my hit my page at GGC LLC DC. That's the Instagram page, and that's the website as well www.ggclcdc.com and man hit me up bro i got all that whatever you want to know about the, about the about that business i'm gonna open book for sure yeah i heard him so the, i just pinned the, the instagram page check them out reach out get connected it's all about the knowledge and connections and re relationships so make it make sure if you're interested i see a couple of people said that this is a market in the comments a mar markets minorities should take advantage of i see people saying they on it if you need someone to connect with, Rod is here. He said, reach out to him, and y'all going to make it happen. And so shout really out quick. to my, my and Viola. Is, they, 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 they like the Ciroc of this thing right now. They, 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 they heavy, man. It, it, more like a lifestyle brand to this point. But they got licenses in Missouri, Oregon, Colorado, Michigan, Cali, and now Maryland. So we, we lit, man. We out here. So we working, for sure. Absolutely. So I promised uh, the viewers that I'll take some questions. We only got about three minutes, so about... In about one minute, can you take one minute to just answer this question really quick? I'm good. Aja, Aja Honey B said, how do you balance having multiple businesses? Seems like it's not passive income. When do you sleep and find time for yourself and loved ones? <laughs> hey, man. Since a young <laughs> that much. And, I, and I, again, I, it goes back to being an athlete. Time right. and able to, like, you know what I'm saying? commit to certain things and dedicate time and set aside time to get certain things done. But ask anybody else in the chat, I sure make time for myself as well too. But like I say, I'm up, I'm up. If you, if you follow my gram and I might be out at night, you might see me out at three in the morning. Then at six 30, you see me on the road going to the office, you know, but mm -hmm. you sleep when you're dead, man. Like, I think rest is important, but at the same time, like I'm chasing right now, bro. So I'm, I'm, I'm on it. Then I got an officer. So I have a daughter. You know, me and her mom are together right now, but we, we have a great co-parenting situation going on. So that was to her, but I'm able to kind of, you know, get her when I, you know, when I, when I, when she needs me. But she lives with her mom most of the time, so that allows me to move a lot, of, a lot more freely as well. Also, so big shout out to. All about, it's all about balance, man. Right. It's all about balance. So, all right, man. Look, so before we go, man, I'm going to take this time. I'm going to give you this last. We got a minute left, man. Just to drop. I mean, let the people know. You know. Um, what you got going on, what your next upcoming endeavors is. I know that you got like a panel going on tomorrow. Tell people about that really quick. And if you can give some words of encouragement before you go, man, please do so. The floor is yours. Actually, well, the panel is next Friday at the Howard Theater. It's a um, green party. All black panel. Myself, Al Harrington, Linda Green, and uh, my, my guy Chip, who runs the Howard Theater. He's in the hemp business. We'll all be on the um, next Friday is a virtual panel, but it's, they're still taking up to like 75 people in the Howard Theater as well. This is with the mask. And everything. So check it out if you can. Um, in terms of, you know, just dropping a few nuggets, man, like I said before, bro, like it's nothing that's, that beats hard work, but at the same time, even more important than that, being a good person. And Absolutely. Respecting people and people, you know, what I'm saying, I do the right way. So you might need them one day. For you as well, and I've been big on that. Like I, God has blessed me with the ability to, like, the different people and network and move with different, different circles and 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 make relationships. And I've been, I had that ability, man. And I'm trying my like, and leverage that to better opportunities. But I'm an open book, man. And I'm always here to give back. Whenever somebody needs me, they call me. I'm, I'm I'll be there. If I can't be there physically, I'll cut a check. But I love to, you know, make sure that you for good, man. Anybody that want information. You got my info. Hit me up, bro. People that know me know it's love, man. I'm, I appreciate you guys for having me, bro. Appreciate, appreciate you for joining us, brother, man. Hey, look, you keep on doing your thing. We locked in, bro. Fact. You know what I'm saying? So this ain't the last conversation we're going to have. Thanks again on the behalf of Community Connoisseurs for joining us tonight, man. Love. Love, bro. Peace out, man.
So there you have it, Rod. TDC. What's up, Tony? Thanks again for that plug, man. We community connoisseurs really appreciate that. Again, this is the moment of truth. We bring you this every Thursday night at 7.30 p.m. We bring in great individuals that's doing great work in their respective areas and fields of endeavor. Please join us every Thursday night. If you're not already following Community Connoisseurs, take a moment just to give us a follow at Community underscore Connoisseurs. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Bless up. See you next week. Peace.